on. All right, so today we are going to, this is actually part one of the listing um, conversion class. I changed the title of it just to make it sound sexy because, you know, want it to sound fresh and new and something different, um, but it's still kind of the same same concepts, um, which Kyle, it's been a minute since you've taken this. Obviously, Ashley, you're new, so this is all new for you. And Kim, it's been a minute since you've taken the class too. So um, so basically focusing in the next two weeks on how do we get inventory, right? Listings, and what does that look like? So in, in Momentum, we don't call it a listing presentation. We call it a listing conversation. And so any of us could sit down and have a meaningful conversation with someone about helping them sell their homes uh, or their house. And so, you know, a lot of times, especially newer agents, they gravitate towards buys because they don't feel confident enough to take the listings. But he who lists lasts, right? And he who lists the homes controls the market. Um, we know, statistically speaking, that if we're doing the right marketing around a listing, we should generate one and a half buy sides for every listing that we take. Um, and then we know that if a home, one home goes in the market, that two to three more homes are listed over the next 90 days. And so um, are we doing the right activities to make sure that we at least get an opportunity to have a conversation with those, with those people? So with that being said, let me do a share screen here. Oh, I grabbed my materials too. So next week we'll dive into more of like the actual like steps of it. But this week we're going to just talk about the strategy of how to build um, the relationship. Okay, and you guys, I emailed you the materials. You should have those in your inbox. Um, so the purpose here is obviously we wanna teach you a conversational approach um, to helping people make an informed and intelligent decision about selling their home. Um, you know, selling, buying and selling is very emotional. And so it's important for us to stay neutral, right? And to help them make informed and intelligent decisions. I was just on a coaching call and we've been there in Pennsylvania and we've been talking about the same client for months. And now it's down to the point where they had to call the police because these people are so crazy. And so, so not making intelligent decisions there. Right. And so how do we help people stay and uh, keep the emotions in check? Right. And then the expectation is that we want you to be more confident to feel like you can work with sellers, um, with serious people who want to buy and sell homes. And the result, I'm going to show you guys how you can get between 16 and hundred closings. And obviously today we're talking about listings. So expireds for sell by owners, your network, um, Oh, somebody's trying to jump in. Hold on. It must be Tanya. Uh, your uh, farm areas, if you're farming, last week we talked about farming. Um, your network or sphere of influence, top 50, you'll hear me talk about that a lot. So again, just today we're really hyper-focused in on how do we get new listings. And obviously we, we want you to have a repeat and referral business, right? That's the beauty, beautiful thing once you're in the business a minute. And today we're going to talk just solely about sellers, okay? Oh, come on, let's move forward here. Um, okay, the financial security of somebody who's effective at converting. And so, you know, Nate, Nate will tell you that he doesn't necessarily prospect every single day, although we all have been, those of us in the gas program have been challenged, right? Kyle, we missed you yesterday, um, just getting into gas. And so uh, we all were challenged, right, to make 10 contacts a day. And so, but, but what Nate will, he, you know, what Nate does is every day something goes out in his orbit that lets the world know that he's in business. And so when we think about sending that out, but then do we know what to say to convert? And so that's where scripts and dialogues come in. We're not going to talk about scripts and dialogues today, but if you look in your class materials, it is chocked full of scripts and dialogues, right? And how do we build our confidence? You know, Kyle, you did some theater work when you were younger. Um, you know, the best way to get over nerves is preparation, right? And so when we practice our scripts and we know what to say, it makes it easier for us to convert people and overcome objections, okay? So if we look at phase one here, assuming that we would take a little bit of vacation time in, in the year, but we work 45 weeks, if we just set one appointment per week, just one, right? One, that that would result in 45 appointments. And if only 70% of those actually became an appointment that we went to and we had eyeball to eyeball, that would be 32 meetings. And if we only were able to convert 50%, which you guys, the national average is about 65%. And some of us might say, well, my conversion rate's more like 99%. Well, then I would challenge you that you're not going on enough listing appointments. Um, and you're probably only going on listing appointments where people know you, right? And that's good. That's fine. We want those, but we also want you to go on listing appointments where they don't know you. Um, so they, but they get an opportunity to know you and what, and decide whether or not they want to do business with you. So for the sake of this discussion though, 50%, that would be 16 additional listings. Um, and then if only half of those sold, that'd be eight additional transactions. Now we know that more like 75% of the homes sell. And so that, that would be 75% of 16, which anybody good enough to do that in math in their head, 
I am not, especially this morning. So 16 times 75% would actually be what happened. I did the wrong number times 75% would actually be 12 transactions. And right now an average commission of let's just say $9,000, that's $108,000 more in income GCI, just because you have a plan, right? And having a plan and working it consistently. Um, I love Steve Cushing and his, um, his his business plan is very simple. He wants to set two appointments every week to get face to face with people and he does open houses, right? That's it. And he left for vacation. If you guys know Steve, he vacations every summer in, in Michigan. Um, he told me before he left that he had as much in his pipeline and had closed as much as he was he had done for the whole entire year last year. And so that's pretty good, right? And it's a very basic formula. Um, there's a team that is coached within the workman family. And their market's down 30%, uh, but they're up by 20%. And their formula is really simple. They come together every morning. They huddle for 15 minutes in the office face-to-face. -face. They they role play for 30 minutes, and then they prospect for an hour. And so thinking about that, even I know some of you are not on teams, but um, some of you are. And so you know, thinking about just that effective formula, could you even do that for yourself? right? Not on a team, but can you look at your day, plan your day, that's your huddle, right? You role play, you know, read the scripts and dialogues. Every class that you guys come to has scripts and dialogues. Uh, read those, right? And if you're in gas or you have an accountability partner, call them up and role play with them, right? Role play and then prospect consistently for an hour. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the market being different. And so I think we have to be different, right? We have to be different. We have to show up different and we have to do more, right? We, 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 it's been, um, I'm not gonna say it was easy because COVID market was hard in my opinion, um, but we have to be different, right? And, and not to quote Jared James, but I'm going to quote Jared James because I think it's really timely. Something that he says from the stage is that they have to know you in the K-N-O-W in order to know you, which is N-O, right? So in order to know if they want to do business with you or not, right? So we have to have enough people, you know, knowing you, Kyle, so that they can decide. And then when Ogmandino says that, you know, every no gets me that much closer to the yes, right? Um, so those of you jumping in, Tanya and Lisa, I will get you, assuming that is Lisa from Rose's team, Lisa? I don't know. You'll have to tell me when you come on. If you're still connecting to audio. I'll get you guys the class materials when I'm done. Okay, so our plan. So the no, do, and have of a listing conversion plan. So obviously, hold on a second. Somebody's in the chat. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, cool. Uh, so sub, so converting. So we've, we're talking about sellers. Relationship-based selling. And so you guys have heard this before, but we don't need leads. We need relationships. And how many, what was there, just shy of 6 million homes that sold last year? And we generated as, as an industry over 200 million leads. So do the math there. Like something's not right. <laughs> <laughs> with the leads that we're generating, right? And so we don't need leads. You don't need to go buy leads. You need more relationships. Again, people need to know you. Um, and then what do I need to do? And what are the things I need to have? So on page 39 is a bunch of supplements for you guys. So some examples of things. And then what do I need to know? And this comes down to my scripts and my dialogues, um, having different messages, which we'll go into more next week. But Kyle and I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago on a coaching call. And we talked about the difference of being informed and being affected, right? Was it affected, Kyle? That was the word affected? I think it was affected. It was either impacted or affected. Was it infected? Uh, yeah, I think that was it, right? Affected and informed. So when I'm informed, and I shared this with Roberta yesterday, when I'm informed, I can see things from up here, right? And I'm looking at it from a bird's eye view. I know trends. I know the interest rates. I know floor plans. I know what builders are doing. I, I'm informed, right? And, and we have to be informed, Kim, right? Otherwise, we'd be derelict our job. We got to be informed. But there's a difference of being impacted, right? And being affected by the information that you're gathering. And so I think it's important that when we talk about our scripts and dialogues, right, that we have those, we're informed, right? We're ready, we're prepared, but then not getting in that space of letting it affect us, right? And causing immobility, okay? There are people out there moving, there are, just do they know you, Kim, and why they should do business with you, right? And so we got to know all of our scripts and dialogues, we got to know the trends, we got to know what's going on. Um, but then, you know, we, but then we have to do, we have to go out and actually do it as well. As well. Um, <clears throat> some of you know the Tupperware lady, her name's Rosemary. I love Rosemary. I have her saved on my phone so that when she calls me, I know it's her. This lady, I actually would love to bring her in on a class on how to convert because she does not hear the word no. 
she called me a couple years ago and uh, wanted me to have a pup tupper party, right? And you know, she had gone a couple years prior to that. She had made her way. I think through every female's house that summer, all of us had a Tupperware party. And so Rosemary did, does not know the word no. And so her objective isn't just to have one party. Her objective, Roberta, is that everybody there books a party. And this lady makes over $100,000 a year selling Tupperware. Okay. And so when she called me, I said, you know, I moved away. I don't really have anybody up here where I live that would want to go to a Tupperware party. And she goes, well, that's okay. She goes, you know, you still work at the office in Glendale. I said, yeah. And she goes, well, how about you have a party there? And I'm like, no, nah, I don't think management would like that. But, well, okay. How about you have just a, a magazine, a magazine party? You just take a magazine. I mean, this lady was on me. She would not let me say no. Right. And so when we think about our own businesses, are we that tenacious? And again, how much Tupperware do you need to sell in order to make a hundred thousand dollars? I mean, I know it's kind of expensive stuff, but we're in real estate. Our average commission checks nine thousand dollars. We can hit a hundred grand pretty easily, right? Uh, and so, so we're not having to sell a bunch of Tupperwares. Where I'm going with that. So, are we really committed to that? And do you have a way to overcome those no's? And so, that's where getting into the scripts and dialogues, practicing them, and making making them be a part of your DNA, so that when you hear the no, you have a way to turn that into a yes. If anybody wants to have a Tupperware party, I'm happy to share. <laughs> Rosemary's information. I will tell you, I learned how to make salsa from her and I'm, a, I'm afraid to call her, but I'm out of the Chipotle seasoning and Tupperware makes this really amazing Chipotle seasoning. And it's not the same as you get at fries, but I'm afraid to call her because I'll be having a Tupperware party. So, so I muddle through. Um, okay. So with all of our momentum classes, we have core beliefs, right? And so we have to check our minds. And I know you guys probably get tired of hearing me say this, but it's so important. You know, um, I, I had had a little brouhaha with someone back in August about the market who had had real bad stinking thinking. And I literally, hung up the phone and said, okay, let me prove that it's not, that's not that hard. And I have three deals closing this month. So, and I'm, it's not even my, I, you guys are my full-time gig. Right. And so, um, I, I, I don't want to say that to sound cheeky or discount maybe some of the struggles that people are having, cause that's not my intent, but our, our core beliefs in our mind, that is three quarters of the battle that we do. Um, and it doesn't matter if we're selling widgets or pharmaceuticals. If your brain is not in the right spot and you think it's hard or you think there's lack, then that is what we're going to focus on. Okay. So core beliefs, if I were you, I would take page six and print this out, laminate it and put it somewhere where you see it often. Okay. Especially when you've had a bad day to round, to come back at the end of the day and read these core beliefs so that you don't go to bed with that bad, that bad day lingering. Okay. So my favorites are, uh, there's no growth without discomfort. And some of you, Ashley, you're new. So this one probably really resonates with you, right? But just remember that, you know, when we go to the gym and we flex our muscles, that's discomfort, but there's no growth without it, right? And so, um, and some of us, you know, the unicorns have disappeared. And so this might really resonate with you, Roberta and Tanya. You guys have been in the business a minute. You might be feeling like, wow, <laughs> I'm not feeling very comfortable right now because I need to change. My business needs to change, right? Number two is, is one of my core beliefs I say every day is that I live in a world of abundance. And so when we can focus on abundance, right? Uh, what we focus on, we, we, we get more of, okay? So if you focus on lack, you focus on fear and uncertainty, you will create more of that. And so getting into a world of abundance and if you, let's say you sit in open house, Kim, and no one shows up. Great. I live in a world of abundance. And by the way, my little trick on open houses is the ones I didn't really actually want anyone to show up to because I had a lot of work I needed to catch up on or a good book I wanted to read. Those were the ones were always really busy. So take stuff with you that you want to actually do and you'll have a good open house. <laughs> That's my little trick. Uh, number six is there's only a cost in the issue. The, in, it, cost is only an issue in the absence of value. Um, so I like to put pumpkin spice in my coffee. And one year I went to the store to buy it. And a little thing like this was like $7.99. And they had jacked the price because it was pumpkin spice season, right? And I paused and I and I actually didn't buy it because I looked at the ingredients and I realized I had all the ingredients in my cabinet already at home. So I didn't, I ended up making my own pumpkin spice. But cost was absolutely an issue in the absence of value. I couldn't justify in my mind when that same jar had been a couple dollars cheaper previous month to pay that. And so when you're sitting across the table, Roberta, from someone, and now you guys saw the, the lawsuit, right? We settled the lawsuit with Remax. And we can talk about that a little bit if you guys want to. Um, I think that we need to have some good dialogue so that when the next listing appointment you go on, how are you explaining Cobroke, right? So because, you know, there are some, that obviously was an issue. We settled for a reason, right? And so, um, you know, 
I have my own thoughts about that, about how the lawyers are spinning it, which is, it's not, it's not pretty. It's making us look bad, but anyway, such as that is with lawsuits. Uh, but anyway, so when we sit down and you're asking for X apples, whatever X apples are in your business, does that seller feel like I'm getting enough value? Or is it $7.99 for a little tiny jar that you can't justify the price? So we're all going to have to get really good at explaining co-broke, right? And explaining why it, it, the seller should want to offer co-broke. And we're also going to have to get really good at protecting our commission when we represent buyers. So the buyers understand, you know, why. And you guys, I know it's scary right now and this is all uncertainty, but as an industry, we will pivot. We'll come out of this. And as, I, as I've said often is that this is an opportunity for us to level up our skill set. Um, Roberta, I don't know if you remember, but maybe not, I don't know if maybe, maybe this is before your time, but, uh, there was changes years ago in the FHA appraisal process, right? Started being where the appraisers were actually going to do inspections and Kim, you would have thought that the industry lost its mind. Oh, that's the end of it. We're never going to close another FHA deal. They're going to ruin the deals. Right. And it was a hot second where we all adjusted to the new normal and life went on. Right. And so is there some change? Yeah, absolutely. Change is coming, but change isn't always bad. Right. And so cost is only the absence of value. You have to make sure that when you sit across from that seller, you are delivering enough value. Um, I think some of you I've sent out um, the, the 110 or whatever it is, things that the Russo team does when they list a home. If you want that, send me an email. It's a fabulous document that literally when it goes through like we make a key for the file, we put a lockbox on, we put it in the MLS, which by the way, that absolutely should be in your listing conversation is that you're going to put the home in the MLS, right? Um, I know two agents in our office who lost listings uh, to competition because the competition made it sound sexy that they were going to put it in this network of X number of people that have access to it, yada, yada, yada. And the one agent was like, so you mean the MLS, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of a, a palm to the forehead moment for both of them because they were like, well, duh, I'm going to put the house in MLS, but they didn't say it. And you have to remember, this is every day at the office for us. It's not for someone who's been in their home 10, 12 years, right? Uh, number seven, as also you guys have heard me say this, is I will not convert 100% of the leads I do not generate. You should not get out of bed tomorrow morning and wonder who needs your services. And our C leads, Kyle, are some of the most underrated and neglected people in our pipeline, right? Because we think they're C's. And they're out 90 days a year, whatever. Tanya uh, and Nate, on Nate's team, they had a story of a guy who one of the buyer's agents was working with. And um, he was a year out and ended up buying way sooner than a year from a different from a different person. And that was a, a, a uncomfortable learning moment for the two of them because they just thought, well, he's a C, he's a year out. We'll follow up with him in a year. Well, we shouldn't be doing that. Your C's need love too, you guys. And if you look at the ABCs that Workman advocates, we talk about A's being week one, right? A is somebody who's actively working, right? You have an appointment, they're ready to go. B is someone who's uh, 30 to 60 days out or 30 to 90, I'm sorry, 60 to 90 days. And then C's or anybody that's not 90 days plus. And so week one, you're working with your A's. Week two, you're working with your B's. Week three, you're working with your C's. Week four, we're working top 50, okay? Top 50 needs to be loved on too. And so your C's need to be touched. And my objective, Kim, with my C's is I don't, how do I make them an A? What's it gonna take to make them an A? Right. And so you and, and I want C's because C's mean that in six months I have business in my pipeline. And so we want to make sure we put those people in there. Right. Because I don't want to get out of bed tomorrow and wonder who needs my services. Uh, number 10, home sell for two reasons. And I think this is important for all of us, especially new people, is that if you, we have to be good at pricing and we have to use the MLS to our benefit. OK, um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Some of the scripts and dialogues that come out of this with sellers now, you know, once because this is making headline news and, you know, Remax being one of the big giants. Um, it'll be interesting to see if those other real estate companies fold and, and settle as well, because we are I think we're the second uh, the second company to settle with this with this lawsuit. Um, and so um, lawyer fees must have been getting really expensive. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the MLS, how how we navigate that, right? But MLS exposure is the best. Um, if you're putting something in there and you're using it to, you're using all the fields, right? You have good directions, you have the right schools, you have good write-up in your description. All of that is searchable content on the internet. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're utilizing MLS. And, and my little rant about professional photography, it's so cheap, you guys, unless you're a novice and you've taken some classes with how to use your iPhone, which I guess the new iPhone can film a movie, <laughs> which great. But unless you know how to do that, like go go pay someone to take your pictures. It's it's super important that you have good photography. I I always cringe when I see some seasoned agents using their cell phone and you it's the selfie in the bathroom with the toilet seat up. 
Like it's the, I mean, Kim, you laugh, but it's legit. You go, go look through the MLS. Right. Uh, and maybe that's a, maybe that's a post someone could put on, on Facebook. Like, Hey, this is mar- what you don't do to market a home. Right. Uh, so pricing, being really good at pricing, understanding the trends and benchmarks that exist in neighborhoods price. your If you own a home, go run comps in your own house, right? Pick a house in your neighborhood, run comps and pay attention to what it actually sells for. Get good at that. There are lots of different tools. I'm very old school with how I run my pricing. You could use RPR. You could use, um, what's the other one? RPR and there's another one. Somebody help me out here. I know obviously KB Core has Core Present, which I would highly encourage all of you to use that as well. Um, but I thought there was another another. Uh, Is it Cloud CMA? Thank you, Kim. Yes, I've Cloud never CMA. used it, but yeah. Yeah. So though you have those two options, I don't care what you use, um, but just be good at whatever it is you choose to use. And there is a class on pricing. I don't I don't know when I have that on the calendar, but we do have a class about pricing. And then lastly. Um, Number 14 is that pricing homes is not necessarily an exact science. We don't have a crystal ball. Um, We can be good at pricing. We can pay attention to benchmarks and things that exist, but sometimes houses sell for reasons that are just outside the crystal ball, right? And so I don't want that to be an excuse for laziness, but sometimes things do happen. And sometimes sellers have intuition that doesn't make any sense to us, but they do. And so we kind of have to pay attention to that and ask probing questions and try to understand why, like, what does that look like? Okay. Um, try to get into it and understand Uh, Jennifer closed a deal, uh, last month and the lady went to a psychic and the psychic told her not to fire Jennifer because the house had been on the market almost a year, not to fire her. It wasn't her agent and that her house would close in August. And sure enough, it did. (laughs) So, so, you know, I have your opinions about psychics all you want, but it worked out in Jennifer's favor. Got that deal closed and the buy that person's also buying too. So sometimes things don't happen the way that we think they're going to happen. Uh and and you know, some, sometimes we have to get get out of the way of that. But it's not an excuse for not being a good steward of understanding the market values. Um, okay, so let's talk about vital activities. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time going through these, um, and then that will be the wrap on our class for today. Uh, so lead generation, right? So one and two are there for one and two for a reason. Got to be finding people that want to do business with you. And then now after I get them, am I saying the right stuff to have them be attracted to me to want to hire me? All right. Each of you bring something amazing and valuable to the table. Um, and I think all of us have a past life, right, of, of something we've done in the past as far as our, our um, careers. And so understanding that, like, so take some time to really understand you know, your core values and your value proposition. Um, anytime I coach a new person, especially if they want to have a team, the first thing we talk about is core values and mission. Because I can't, I can't help you grow a team if you don't know what those are. Right. Because we want to we want to hire and fire around our core values. And so you can you don't have to have a team in order to have core values. Right. In order to have a mission statement. And then we take that a step further and we put that into our listing, into our presentation for our listing conversation. Those people who are sharing their core core values and mission with people, it's different. Right. And oftentimes we'll have these things. We want to kind of keep them private. Right. Want to keep them close to the heart. I say shout it from the rooftops. Because it's something different that your your competition isn't doing. And when people are in alignment with that, you will attract more, right? You will attract more. Because if you think about your mission statement kind of being like a, a beacon, right? Those searchlights, you know, that you see. Uh, so that's what it is. It's basically saying, hey, come, come do business with me because I'm different, right? I want to be in alignment with that. Number three is admin prep. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. But 75% of what we do in a transaction is by definition not dollar making, Right. It's not. The only parts are negotiating the contract and negotiating the bins are. Those are money-making activities. But you attending a home inspection, not money-making activity. Does it need to be done? Absolutely. Um, I personally like to attend my home inspections because I think that's where agents fall um, out of control is if they don't attend the home inspection. Uh, so, you know, I mean, if it's a real savvy buyer, I may not go. But for the most part, I like to go. I don't go for the whole thing, but I go for at least the, the wrap and review the, the, uh, the summary with my client. Um, marketing and exposure, that's part of my, uh, you know, that's part of my favorite parts, right. And presenting and negotiating. Um, I also love that part, putting the deal together and then closing preparation and post closing activities. So let's unpack these a little bit more, you guys. So lead gen. So this is finding people. Again, I go back to Steve Cushing, love his business plan. So simple, yet very effective. He, every week, two people, eyeball to eyeball with two people. 
right? And so uh, I love that. It's so simple, but yet it's very, very powerful. So finding people, we got for sale by owners, expired or canceled contracts, go back a year or two, go back five years on those, you know, go find people that their, their home failed to sell a couple of years ago, see if they're still interested in moving. Um, you have farming areas, which we talked about last week, we have your network, social media, and of course, doing any kind of just listed or just sold um, campaigning into an area, um, canvassing an area. And so you guys, we also shared with you a couple months ago, actually, it was the August meeting, uh, or no, it was the August meeting, I think it was. Anyway, it's out there, the four pillars uh, of, of generating different types of, of leads. And so if you don't have that and you want it, send me, include that in the email and I'll send it to you. A lot of really cool different ideas on how to lead gen. But all of you, when you leave the house, should be wearing your swag. Use yourself as a moving billboard, right? People should know when they look at you that you're in real estate, right? Go set up, go set up your, if, you're, if your computer like mine says, ask me about real estate, it's got a bunch of Remax balloons on it. My water bottle's got Remax on it, right? Go set up at the Starbucks and do business from the Starbucks, right? People will engage you, be friendly, be be open. I was getting an IV treatment a week, I don't know, month ago and the lady sitting in there, I went in there with full intentions of putting my headset on and working. But I ended up spending an hour talking to this lady who begged me practically for my business card when I left because they're thinking about buying a property up here. So I probably should have got her contact information, um, but I can get it because the doctor obviously knows her. So, but again, I went in there with the intention of working and I ended up chatting up this lady for an hour and lead genning, right? And so make it obvious, right? And and look for ways to connect with people. Um, you know, um, someone was teasing me about uh, going to the grocery store and acting like a damsel in distress. And then, you know, if there's a cute guy around, be like, hey, can you reach that for me? Could we do the same thing in real estate? Could you go hang out in the produce section, right? And just hang out there and talk to people. I have a coaching client that every winter she volunteers and bags groceries um, during the holidays at her local grocery store. They are number three in their county. It's her and her husband, one buyer's agent, one admin. And the t t number one and number two companies are a Howard Hanna, which is a real big brand on the East Coast and a Remax office. So again, number three in their county and their competition are offices that have hundreds of people. And so these things work, right? It's just whether or not we're willing to get out of our comfort zone and go bag groceries. Um, all right, so admin prep. So, uh, or I'm sorry, lead, lead conversion. This is on page eight. So you guys are gonna get a copy of the um, asking the pre-listing questions. So that's important to dive in, right? Ask pre-listing questions before you go on the appointment. Um, I wanna know details about the house. I wanna know uh, if they have more than one mortgage. And I wanna know, have you been on Zillow? Uh, I'm still going to go check Zillow, but I want to know if they've been on Zillow. And I asked the question, right? What do you think your house is worth? And, you know, if they say, well, that's why I'm calling you. Well, okay, great. Now I know what I'm dealing with as far as personality style, but most people will tell you, yeah, I think it's about this or, or I need to get this. Right. And so I'm, I want to fact find and gather everything that I need. Okay. Um, and then getting into the pricing, looking at the pricing, you know, sometimes if it's a specific prop, uh, product, sometimes it makes sense to do a two-step listing appointment. So I go to the house, I tour the house, I see it, then I come back with comps, right? Especially if it's highly upgraded or it's rule or whatever, luxury. Maybe it's not upgraded at all <laughs> and it needs to be you know, priced appropriately, right? So it's okay to do that. I know sometimes we don't want to do that just for time, but sometimes, it's, sometimes that's necessary, okay? Confirm the appointment. Um, call to confirm the appointment, especially if it's someone that you've never met, maybe send a text with your video chat, you know, that says, Hey, this is Ashley from Remax professionals. Just want to put a face with the name. So, you know, I'm coming over, blah, blah, blah. Uh, also when you're calling to confirm, if there's more than one person involved in making the decision, um, if they're not going to be available, then reschedule it. Cause you don't want that. You don't want to do your presentation. If, if you can help it, sometimes you can't, but in most cases you want to try to be in front of the decision makers. Okay. Um, having the listing, uh, agreement prepared ahead of time. I know most of us are doing things digitally these days, but you can go ahead and have your templates ready so that it's easier to get get going, right? And fill out some of that stuff ahead of time um, so that it's easier when you're there to do that. Uh, getting on the listing channel. So whatever that looks like, whether it's reading core values, listening to a special song, you know, visualizing, whatever that looks like for you guys individually, it's really critical. Um, we used to have an agent that worked in our office and he told me one time that he would go like an hour before a listing appointment, he'd drive around the neighborhood, he would find a, a local place, whether that was a McDonald's or coffee shop, and he would just sit there, review his comps, review his listing presentation, and just visualize like what life felt like living in that neighborhood. And that's kind of cool, right? And that way you can 
speak to like, hey, you know, I was at the coffee shop. What a cool place, you know? Um, and I think previewing, you know, homes, if you can, that are around that property that are for sale, that also gives you kind of an idea of the benchmarks and trends that exist in the neighborhood, um, especially if your home has either not been updated or has been updated and you're looking at comps that maybe have or haven't or partially. Um, and so getting your brain in the right spot. Take the time, Kyle, to visualize. What do I want to have happen as a result of going on this appointment? Well, obvious answer is you want them to list with you, right? And so spend a few minutes and just get your mind in the right spot. And maybe that's a special song that gets you pumped up. Maybe it's a funny cat video, whatever that looks like for you. Figure out what that step is and implement that. Being on time. Uh, being on time is one of those things that is really critical. Um, when we're not on time, we demonstrate that we are not in control of our own time and that we don't have respect for the seller's time. And so I will call if I'm going to be one minute late, I will call. Now, I was also raised that if you're not somewhere 10 minutes early, you're late. And so I've spent a lot of time in my car <laughs> because people also don't want you to be early because <laughs> you can feed a child, make a bed, you know, do a lot of things in 10 minutes to get ready for an appointment. Okay. So uh, be on, just be professionally attractive and be on time. Okay. If you're going to be late, let them know, right. Um, having the listing conversation. So we're going to dive into this more, but setting the tone helping them uncover their needs, right? What are their needs? Typically needs are show up in the form of time and price. I have to net a certain amount or I need to be somewhere in a certain amount of time. So helping them prioritize those needs. And sometimes those needs flip-flop, right? Um, sometimes people go from like, I need this amount of money to, nope, we need to get the house sold. And any seller who tells you they're not in a hurry is a big fat liar. Because <laughs> once that sign goes in the yard, they are in a hurry and they want their home sold. It's a pain, right? We know that. That's why that's why some of these companies prey on that, right? Because they can say, hey, we're going to take the stress out of this so no one's looking through your underwear drawer, right? And so they prey on that because it is stressful, right? Kids get stressed. Animals get stressed, okay? Uh, we're going to go over the pricing tools and review pricing information, um, agreeing on where do we start, what's the appropriate pricing point to start at. And then one of my favorite things in this class um, is the roles. So reviewing what, what their role is and what your role is um, and what the expectation is. You know, that is the thing, that is the number one thing that NAR says, or not NAR, um, AAR says, is that the complaints that they get is lack of communication. And so when we have this document that talks about the expectations, and I think this is going to be a critical document for defending our commission too, um, is talking about what is the role? What, what do I expect of you as my client? And what can you expect of me as your agent? Okay. Uh, and then closing for the listing agreement, explaining the listing agreement. You know, maybe this is something we need to have Shannon do a class on is really, do we really know how to explain the listing agreement and what they're signing? Right? I mean, I know sometimes I screw up and don't fill out the commission thing, right? And Janice has to fix it for me. <laughs> and so, uh, so do we, what's our, do we really feel comfortable explaining that? So that, I'll, I'll make a note of that and see if Shannon will do a class for us. And then getting the listing agreement signed. So those are our admin preps. Or I'm sorry, that's the lead conversion stuff. And then admin prep. So we have, um, measurements of the of the house this is page nine measurements um you know don't do what my mother does and use her feet to walk a room because you know that's not an accurate measurement <laughs> but you can go to amazon or even go to we serve and buy one of those cool little gadgets that's a laser beam that shoots across the room and this by the way is a way to convert so if, if i have a clipboard ashley and i whip out my go go gadget and i do the laser beam and then I ask you to write down the measurements on the clipboard, that is a form of conversion. I'm now physically involving you in the process of this. Roberta, go ahead. And I get your concept there of um, a method of conversion, and I've used that before. But just FYI, Arizona Imaging offers, uh, when they come out and do the photography, they do a floor plan. Okay. And it's like my head has just blown off the top because I get to offer that now. It's okay. kind of cool for the appraisal side and it's just an additional feature that I give to the to the um, clients that will have a floor plan to go along with the marketing. Okay. And Kim put in the chat Cuba Casa. So that yeah, like it's an app for your phone. So you can, you know, it you just walk the house, the phone scans the, the house, and within 24 hours you get a floor plan. Okay. It'll either include the measurements of the room or it won't. The last time I did it, it was totally off. So obviously <laughs> you muted yourself. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. All right. So two good options. I didn't know um, Kevin was doing that at Arizona Imaging. Uh, so, and making sure everything gets put in MLS correctly, right? Uh, if you're going to clone the listing to start, make sure you go and check stuff because you don't want to clone mistakes. Um, I, again, I, you know, interior, exterior photos, you don't need to have 62 
photos. 25 is kind of the sweet spot that consumers want to see. And that's what gets loaded up into most of your websites. Put your money shots first. We're so used to doing exterior. Then we go maybe into the kitchen, living room, bedroom, back, 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 backyard. Put all your good shots up front. The consumer wants to see the good shots up front. They don't want to see 12 variations of the front, the front of the house. And then also if you're using any of the uh, Max Streets or Max Max Street, <laughs> I'm, calling, I'm getting my Remax products confused. Design Center. If you're using any of the products in there, you if you load if you load your photos, um, the money shots first. You're not having to make edits when you get your stuff out of uh, Max Center for marketing. Okay, um, so a little trick there. Uh, sign in lockbox. You know, make it easy for people to get into it. Uh, people, uh, you know, I know agents will not show houses if they don't have lockboxes. Not that that's good. You should not do that. Um, but I do know agents that do that. And I also have heard stories of agents not putting a sign up because I don't need to. It'll sell without it. Well, how many leads are you missing getting if you don't put a sign up? Right? And I'm probably preaching to the choir for you guys, but make sure you put a sign up. Sending a thank you letter after you get the listing. Um, there's some examples on page 39 of what to say. Um, so send a nice thank you letter. I look forward to working with you. Um, and then obviously getting your showing service, which you guys saw that that new product is on hold. They are not launching today. That was Shannon's email on Friday. They're launching. I guess there were some glitches in that, uh, but setting that up. Obviously, delivering a copy of everything it is your job to make sure the seller gets a copy of the fully executed contract and addendums. Um, and I always like to send the MLS to them before I hit go so that if I have any edits, I want to make edits and make sure they're OK with what I have written up. Um, you know, some sellers are kind of picky that way. But I just want to make sure that I get their approval before I hit go. OK. And then um, putting them into your KB core and getting the loan payoff. This is something I'm going to ask in my up in my info when I'm doing my discovery call is I want to know what their loan balances are. And then when I'm at the appointment, I'm going to have them verify that because I actually want to run cost sheets. And so if I have a price range that exists of, let's say, you know, 325 to 350, and I want them to price it at 330 um, or 335, I'm going to run a cost sheet at that price, but all three prices and go over that with them. Um, and then it's amazing when you do that because they'll say, well, well, gosh, Sarah, we think we should price it at the 335 based on everything we're looking at. And I go, I couldn't agree with you more, right? So it's kind of like that you're setting the tone um, and then I'll have them initial the loan payoff on there because if that's that's typically if my cost sheets are off, it's because we were off on loan payoff, okay? So make sure that you verify that with them and they won't initial it if they don't know that for sure that that's as, as close as it can get, okay? So again, I'm asking that stuff up front and then I'm doing the cost sheet and then, the, then when I do get an offer, I do a side-by-side -side comparison because that's again, time and money are the two big things that sellers want. How much money am I making and how much time is it going to take me to sell? Okay. Marketing exposure. We've talked about um, using the MLS. Why is that not going? We talked about using the MLS for our, um, uh, for marketing, right? And any other websites, obviously you guys know how much that gets syndicated out to. Uh, use your stuff that you get from Max Center. You know, push that stuff out. Use the the single page website that goes back to your website. Um, you know, do a, a post on, on all of your social media, okay? Um, Kyle's been doing a great job of doing videos on Reels, um, right? Reels or, or the TikTok? Reels. Reels, yeah. So if you're not friends with Kyle, go friend him and check out some of the videos he's doing. And I know I plugged it a lot, but we got the YouTube class happening on Thursday. So be sure to be there, okay? Uh, just listed. So I know that this not, might not be in everybody's budget to do a just listed and, and you know campaign a, around a bunch of doors, but y'all could door knock 40 doors, right? 10, 10, 20. So 10 on either side, 20 across the street. You could easily door knock flyer or not. Take your business card, Kim, knock on the door and say, hey, I just listed your neighbor's house. Here's my card. Great time to pick your neighbor. And oh, by the way, I we listed the house at whatever price, right? Um, my mind, when we have a listing, there's four opportunities for door knocking. There's the coming soon, right? I'm taking a listing. Look out. It's going to be coming soon. Um, there is the open house. Then it's when I went under contract, right? This is what we did to get the home sold. And then when it sells, there's the final door knock of, by the way, your new neighbors are so-and-so and I sold the house for X. OK, if that person's thinking of moving again, two to three people statistically on the same street will sell. Do you think if you door knocked four times, Kim, that you would get at least an opportunity to have an interview? I'd like to think so. Maybe I'm delusional, but I'd like to think so. Kyle and Janet, they door knocked for an open house, got a listing from it and it sold. Right. So, and it was all, and they said, we, we love your hustle, right? We're, we are going to be moving. We love your hustle. OK. Um, OK, so again. If it's in your budget to canvas and do, you know, 100 doors with the flyer, great. If not, you can take your business card and door knock. Um, flyers for the, the for the actual sign, 
you know, that's up to you if you want to do it. A lot of times they get taken by the picky neighbor or the nosy neighbors, um, but it also is a way to um, track bleeds that are coming through. Um, phone calls to neighbors. Again, if you're going to do like Red X or Vulcan or any of those um, companies where you buy lists, make sure you're following the do not call uh, rules. Okay. Um, soliciting the email or the flyer out to everybody else in the area. Um, if you pick, if you had a listing that was similar to it, maybe go and send the, the information to all those people that showed the property and say, Hey, that one sold, but I have a new listing in the same area. Right. Um, and then um, feedback right? Give feedback from your people. And if you're being asked to give feedback, give good feedback, you guys. Give good, tangible feedback that you don't just say the house is overpriced. How much is it overpriced by? If it smells funny, tell them it smells funny, right? In a polite and professional way. Uh, but give them feedback that somebody can actually work with, okay? And it's important for you to get feedback. I've personally number 29, call the sellers weekly. If, if, I, if my clients call me first, whether that's a buyer or seller, I feel like I've let them down. Um, you know, this is, this is every day at the office for us. It's not for them. And they, every time their home is shown, it's like going on a blind date, right? Before your blind date, anybody gone on one, you're picking out China and wedding invitations and you haven't even met each other. Right. <laughs> and so it's the same thing when the home gets shown, they're, they're excited. They think this is it, right? We're going to the wedding. We're going to, we're getting a contract. And so we don't follow up with them and let them know and give them feedback. They're stuck wondering with the blow off, right? That, that, you know, how come, how come they left me at the altar? Right. Uh, and so make sure you're calling them and make sure you call them on a regular basis. You can set up some automations um, in MLS. You can set up some automations. You can see in MLS how many times it's been shown, how many times it's been blocked, um, how many times it's been saved in a portal um, and similar homes that have are, are on the market around it. OK. Um, writing and negotiating the contract. So, so pro proactively so soliciting multiple offers. That's part of our job, presenting those offers. Um, I know <laughs> that condo I sold in Phoenix, the guy is kind of old school and he's like, I don't want any offers under X price, right? And so he told me that. And so I still presented them to him because that's what I do. But he was very old school with that. I don't want any offers below this price, right? Uh, and then changing, changing the status right away, you guys. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than going to show a house and finding out that it's under contract. So make sure you, you change the status as quickly as possible. Um, it's our job again to, to deliver anything that that client has signed. They need to, they had they need to have a copy of it. Okay. And then uh, negotiating repairs contract changed a couple of years. So we actually get to do our job and negotiate those instead of having to follow what was in the contract. Right. Uh, and so now we get to negotiate that and it doesn't always have to be repairs. Right. I just did one where we, it was a cash deal. And we just renegotiated the price. Right. Um, and so having those things be negotiated professionally and then get a copy of any repair invoices that did happen and make sure your client gets that. Make sure it gets into sky slopes so that we're covering our butts. Right. That those things were taken care of. And you want to do a final walkthrough and make sure. Um, and if there's a lot of repairs, um, you can always pay your home inspector to come back and check off those things. Um, I, I, it's very disheartening to me when I go to a listing appointment on a house that I sold and we did a walkthrough and we, we had receipts or a seller did the work themselves. And my clients tell me that, <clears throat> yeah, it really wasn't taken care of the way it was supposed to be. That doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> Makes me feel like I let my client down that we didn't do a good job on that. So home inspectors will go back out for a minimal fee and check off those things um, if you have a lot of repairs. Okay, so closing and preparation. So scheduling the closing, uh, usually our title companies do this for us, but communication throughout. Um, you know, if something starts to go sideways, you need to be transparent, communicate that with all parties involved. Reviewing the title commitment. I know a lot of us get a little lazy with that, especially if it's our, if it's our title company, but you think, well, Jody's, Jody's reviewed it for us. Make sure you read that stuff. I know it's boring, but make sure you read it. Look look for things in there that could be an issue. Um, I had one recently where we had name wrong, or I think it was the name was wrong. It wasn't a big deal to fix, but it, 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 we need to be fixed, right? Reviewing the settlement statement, also critical. If you're new and you don't know how to do it, go ask Jody to sit down and she'll go over it with you, right? I was looking at one the other day from a lender that I've never done a deal with, and it was it was awful. I didn't like it. It was not, it was really hard to read. It had things on there. I was like, why is this on here? And then they had $300 in miscellaneous endorsements. Like I'm not having my client sign a document that doesn't outline what the heck that is, especially when they're coming to pocket with all the cash they have in the world. What are these, what are these $300 things? I just had to push back on the lender because he was like, well, we're just kind of lumped it in. I'm like, no, 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 we're not doing that. Right. So review the HUD. If you've negotiated concessions for either party, you want to make sure those are accurate. I one time had a deal where the title company had dropped the ball on ordering the HOA. 
And so they tried to slide in a, in a uh, uh, rush fee on my client's HUD. And I was like, no, no, we're, we're not doing that. I, I have proof when I sent you the contract, you dropped the ball on that. So we got to, we have to advocate. Um, you guys saw my post that, that the listing agent wrote me this really nice email about how how I advocated for my clients and that she hadn't seen someone do that in a long time. And I thought, my well, first thought was thank you. But then my second thought was like, that's kind of sad. <laughs> Because that is our job is to advocate for our clients, right? And sometimes that means you got to roll up your sleeves and get, you know, direct. I'll say the word direct. Uh, so in attending the closing, so I've had many agents come through Momentum and tell me that going to the closing is a super critical part of their business plan. It's the last opportunity they have to bond with the client and to represent them. Um, and so, you know, I share that because I haven't always done that. And so uh, it is an opportunity, though, where you can get pictures and, you know, have some fun. If you go to Title Alliance, I think they've got the big giant key. Uh, so you can have some fun with that and making sure that we squeeze the orange, taking a picture of them um, and then save that and go in and do a, a home anniversary so that you can on their one year anniversary, do something with it to remind them that, hey, one year, it's been one year, right? Because uh, one year goes by really fast. All right. Lastly here, post-closing activities. So doing a survey, right? Get them to give you a Google review. Have them write something on Facebook. I like Google better, um, but Facebook works too. Obviously changing the status to MLS. Make sure if you've renegotiated anything that the MLS stuff, that data is correct. You will get fined um, if you report something incorrect on that or you don't change it. Same thing here, door knocking, fourth touch, right? Uh, and again, if you're going to call neighbors, uh, make sure you're following the do not call list. One thing that I like to do that's not on any of the materials, you guys, is I like to try to show up on moving day if I can. And I want to bring food because people forget to eat <laughs> and get cold drinks when they move, right? So I like to show up on moving day, whether it's a buyer or a seller, um, because again, I like to bring food. Um, and then I want to follow up them five to seven days after they're in the home. Um, typically, if, if something's going to happen, they need the home warranty, that's in that window of time. And they're scrambling around trying to unpack. They're not thinking about their home warranty. It's an opportunity for me to, again, provide that level of service. I can initiate the phone call to the warranty company or at least get them the information so they can, right? Um, and then again, follow up in 30 days. And, you know, really great lead gen idea, again, that's not in any of the materials, is why not host a housewarming party? We used to do this um, back in the day on Nate's team. We actually had signs, directional signs that were made up for the housewarming party. So that, again, this was before we had GPS. I'm dating myself here, okay? Uh, and before we had all this digital stuff. And Kim, we would get a list of their names, do a paper invitation. And then what would we do with those names? Put them into our CRM. Right. So now these folks are getting our newsletter. They're not our clients, but they're getting our newsletter. I, sh I show up, I pay for the meat, you know, um, and then I don't talk shop while I'm there, but I just have conversation with people. And it's a really great way to lead gen. Um, Rose had done this with her son when he bought his first house. She had a lender come with him, come with her. And they can, they, they pre-qualified, it was either two or three people that night. And I know she sold at least one house from that. So, right, have your lender come and now we can talk, educate. We, we should be the most popular person at any party, right? Because we, we're, we are such an integral part of people's lives, right? We help people with their primal need of shelter, right? Um, and so those are the, the activities that we have, our vital activities. And so key indicators of success that you want to be tracking are how many of your listings sell? What's the list price to sales price? What's your average days on market before you get an offer? How many days does it take to close? What's your average, are you a five-star agent, right? What's your Google reviews? And then, you know, putting those onto Google. Um, and I think Google is the best place to do it. If you don't have a Google My Business account, get with Alex and get that set up because Google, that's the first thing that people do is they Google you, right? And so these are strategic, these are strat proven strategies and sellers want to work with people who can get results, right? So these are bragging points that you want to have on your resume, if you will, okay? Uh, we are going to dive into the approach. So we're going to talk about establishing a winning relationship, justifying the price. What's our seven step marketing strategy, which by the way, that is trademarked. So after you take that part of the class, you can use that in your listing conversation. Um, makes you look kind of cool that you can have the little TM next to it. Uh, how do we hold the, the plan accountable? How do we net the max for the seller? Um, Jennifer now has a great story about overpricing. One year it took that house to sell. And the crazy thing is, is it sold at the price she told the lady last year to list it at. So now she has a great story, right? She can, you know, it, it was a success in the sense that it did actually sell and she didn't lose the listing, but that's a testimonial that she can now share with other people who want to try to overprice their home, right? And then obviously the inspections and, and uh, negotiating repairs. And the final piece that we're going to talk about is how do we get the home sold, okay? So that is a review of today. So next week, again, talking about what's the difference between 
the conversation uh, versus the uh, presentation, okay? And so we're going to get into that next week, okay? Any thoughts, comments, questions? No? And Lisa, is that Lisa C or Lisa B? Yeah, I don't Hey, Sarah, it's Lisa C. I just jumped on last minute and I'm okay. not uh, photo no worries, appropriate. Just... Computer so I can see my camera is covered still. So. No, you're you're fine. I just want to make sure I get you the materials, okay? Thank you so much. It was you're a good welcome. class. So, thank you. I So I owe Tanya, Lisa, and Roberta. And Roberta, you probably already have these, but I'll send them to you anyway so it's fresh. So, um, okay. So again, uh, tomorrow, if you haven't signed up for the KB Core class that is in person, I believe it's what, one to four at We Serve. Nate has made arrangements for that guy to come in and teach you guys personally. So take advantage of that. Um, and then Thursday, again, on Zoom with, with Josh May, it's going to be a really great class on uh, YouTube. So um, and we got business planning coming up in October and just a lot of great stuff happening for the end of the year. We are doing the pumpkin carving contest again. So time to start thinking about your teams and your themes. Um, that'll be at Arrowhead North. And even if you don't, even if you don't compete, it's still just a really fun afternoon to come see everybody stress out. <laughs> So, so, uh, and Roberta, you, you lost your, uh, your magic touch there. So you're inside. Yeah. So Monica, whoever had Monica on their team always freaking won. So, <laughs> so she doesn't have her anymore. So that the unfair advantage of Monica. So, but anyway, if you guys need anything, please reach out. I'm always here for you as a resource. Uh, if you need something, reach out. Otherwise part two next week, same time, nine o'clock. Okay. Awesome. All right. Have a great day. You guys see ya. Bye.